First Church, I'm going to be real with you this morning. We are here to worship a great God. Now here's your challenge, church. God has provided everything we need to worship Him this morning. He's provided this beautiful setting. He's provided breath in your lungs. He's provided you with a heart to love Him. But it's your choice. It's your decision how you will worship God this morning. So I've got all morning. I'm not sitting down until I see some excitement to worship Him. I don't care if it's honks or claps or yells, but let's get excited. Let's stand up and let's worship the one God. Here we go. 
Come on now, LFC. Happy to see you this morning. I'm going to give you some encouragement from Philippians 1. Kind of goes along with what we're singing about this morning. In verse 6, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you and you and you and you and you and me, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Amen? Is God done with you yet? I heard one person. Is God done with you yet? I heard the same person. He's just louder than all of you. (laughs) If I can give you some encouragement this morning, just know that, that God loves us. He's working on us. He's working on me. I know that for sure. So just keep going. Just keep going. This is called the Father's House. Would you sing? Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. The failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. The failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. And the story isn't over If the story isn't good the Failure's never final When the Father's in the room Failure Failure's never final When the Father's in the room Oh 
What do you say? Forgive me, I'm hitting the strings really hard this morning. I'm just excited. Can you blame me? Yeah? No. I mean, somebody give me some feedback, please. Thank you. All right, this is a fun one. Here we go. Oh, don't lose heart. Oh, don't lose heart. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Don't give up. There is hope. There is always hope. There is peace. Let's move those feet. Here we go. Here. There is a king of glory. There is a God who saved. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up the shout of praise. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the king of glory. I want to invite you to take a posture of prayer. Whatever posture uh, helps you at this point. If it's to sit down, sit down. If it's to stand up, stand up. If it's to 
If it's to stand up and just kind of walk around and, and pace, I like to pray as I as I pace, like I talk on the phone, like I'm talking, like I'm talking with a friend. So I just want to welcome you to take uh, that posture right now. And uh, you know, as we're singing those songs, you know, I've, I've I've spoken with a few of you this week. I've I've spoken with a few of you this morning. I know we've got a lot of, of difficult situations that, that many of you are facing right now. Some of those have to do with yourself and, and, and some things that you're fighting just, just on your own or with your family. Some of those have to do with relationships that, that are broken out with you and, and outside of the family. And, and some of it is, is health issues. Some of it's mental health issues. Uh, you know, just a lot of stuff, guys. And, and I know as we sang those songs, you know, I was, there was part of me going, I wonder if that person that, that's on my heart and that's in my mind, I, I wonder if that person really feels like singing those words right now. I wonder if they really look at those words and go, yeah, I just, I'm just not, I'm not feeling that right now. It's understandable. But see, the hope that we find in Christ, the, the faith that we trust in God, sometimes we act, we behave in such a way that that, that we sing words like that or we trust words like that because we know who God is. We don't act because, because of how we feel at that moment or what's going on right at that moment, but, but we act in faith, we, we sing in faith, we take a step in faith because we know that the God we serve is not finished with this situation yet. He's not finished with us yet. He's not done with that. And so we act in faith. We believe in faith. And we pray in faith. So as we pray this morning, as we go into this time of prayer, I encourage you to proceed with this time not based on how you feel right this moment but proceed in this time based on how you see and feel about and view the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who never leaves us nor forsakes us, the one who sees every little detail of our situation right now. Don't proceed or act based on your own feelings but in faith and in trust in God. So let's pray. Let's come before him now. God, you are good. And God, your mercy, your faithfulness, your love endures forever. God, your your faithfulness, your love, your mercy. God, those things do not stop because we have something in front of us that is impeding our path. God, your love, your faithfulness endures in spite of all of those things, God. And so, God, where we might not feel like praying certain things or asking for certain things. We may not even feel right now about giving you praise and, 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 and we may not feel like giving you glory and giving you honor, God. But God, help us to realize it's not about how we feel, but it's about who you are. It's about the promises that you have made to us, God, the promises that are in your word that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us, God. You see all, and you are in all. You are a part of all. God, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You've, you've made everything, Lord. And because you are the author of those things, we can trust you. We can trust that you know better than us. We can trust that you think 
better than us. We can trust that you are stronger than us. We can trust that you have more insight. We can trust that you have more strength. We can trust that you have more power. We can trust that you have more endurance, God. So let us now give those things to you. God, even those things that seem like maybe there just isn't an answer, that we've tried everything, God, that we have tried everything we know to do on our own and it's just not working. God, we've gone to the experts and it's just not helped. But God, have we truly given it to you? So God, help us to turn whatever that is over to you, Lord. I think of many connected with our congregation, Lord, who are, are expecting surgeries this week, Father. God, an individual who's in a hospital right now and, and we're not sure what it's going to look like here, God. Things are unknown. We don't know how things are going to progress and, 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 and we don't even know what the outlook is, but God, you do. God, be with them now. Lord, be with the, the several individuals who are just fighting emotional pain, God. Who are looking for answers. They've talked to everybody they know to talk to. They've done everything they know to do. And God, the only thing left to do is to just lay it before you. God, help us to trust Help us to rely on you, God. And Lord, help us as individuals to rally around them, God, to be the church, to be your people who love and support and walk beside. God, be with us as a people, as a corporate body, as a family, Lord. God, lead us as a church. God, lead us as people who are seeking after you, God, who are, who are not just seeking answers and to the questions that lay right in front of us, God, or the things that, that maybe in the grand scheme of things don't seem like that big of a deal. God, help us to be asking the right questions, to remain focused on who you've called us to be as a people and as individuals who are after your own heart, God. God, the patterns of the way that you work is that you make the dead come to life. God, you make the barren soil fertile again. God, you take the ashes and the rubble and you build something beautiful out of that, God. Help us to live and to walk in that truth and in the faith of knowing that you are not done yet, God. We thank you. And we walk in trust and in faith, knowing that you're still going to do your thing, God. We just need to jump on board. So help us to do that now, God. It's in your son Jesus' name, not, not only that we pray, but that we will continue to give you honor and glory. Amen. Amen. And as we sing this final song, once again, just invite you to take a posture that you need to take to, uh, to continue worshiping Him this morning. And I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise and Treasures of faith Are never enough came along, then you came along, you put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied, here in your love, oh 
there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid, and I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you All right, here we go You turn morning to dancing You can beauty for ashes Turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into garden You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You turn morning You turn morning to dancing Let's um, 
we're we're here to we're here to serve the Lord. We're here to give Him glory, give Him honor. Um, uh, but I think it's okay to to thank His servants here and there. Can we just thank our worship team uh, for what they do each week? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just really appreciate you guys and, and are grateful for the time. And uh, let's give a hand to our tent holders over here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, the people in the shade appreciate that because I'd, I'd probably say let's just take them down. But uh, yeah, hey, thank you for the wind. But the wind does cause uh, a few a few issues here and there. But uh, hey. We'll just go with it. We'll just go with it. Hey, I want to invite uh, Pastor Alyssa uh, to come up front at this time. And and uh, we're, we're starting something this morning that we haven't done in, in quite a while. Uh, we are going to invite our pre-K students, right? Yes. I got this right? Good. Two years old, up to five years old, not yet in kindergarten. Uh, we are going to invite you, if you're comfortable and interested, um, Pastor Alyssa is going to take you around the building over there to the front um, and just have a special time with our preschool kids. So do you want them to come up front? Is that what we want to do? Does that sound good? Uh, and parents, if you want to go with them, you are welcome to do that. You are invited to do that. Uh, no no problem with that. So let's just have our preschoolers, if you're going to come today, uh, if you would just come up front, that would be awesome. And we're just going to say uh, just a short uh, prayer over you. And if your parents need to come with you to get you to come up, that's okay. Um, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Looks like Alyssa's got to go get somebody too. awesome we love our kids and we love our preschoolers and we're so excited about you guys and uh let me just say yeah there we go hi martha hi guys let me just say a prayer over you and then parents they will be coming back uh at the very end during our our short announcements so we'll get them back to you before this is over or maybe you would prefer we not. I don't know. Which, no, I'm kidding. Uh, let me just pray for you guys. God, I thank you so much uh, for your kids, for your children. Thank you that you have entrusted their parents uh, with them. And Lord, I thank you that you've entrusted us as a church to help grow them in the knowledge and love of you, to help them learn who they are in your sight, God, and to help grow them uh, to be mature followers of your son, Jesus. God, go with them now. We just bless them and um, help them learn. Help them love. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a great time with your friends. I'm going to gonna hop up here. I, yeah, I do need that. Those are my notes. I'm not that good. I um, My family knows this about me. I, I have a weakness. I have several weaknesses, but one of the one of the weaknesses that I do have um, in in my life is and 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 they don't get it, but um, I like bologna sandwiches. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Fried bologna, that is good too. I know where you live. I'm coming for breakfast sometime. Um, or you probably have that for dinner. But yeah, I, I love bologna sandwiches. And, and like I said, my, my family knows this about me. Um, I don't have many indulgences in life. I just don't have things that I crave. But I, I'm not kidding you. I, I, I crave bologna sandwiches. It does. Especially when... Uh, when uh, homegrown tomatoes are in season, right? So there's something about bologna and, and a tomato, like a really good tomato. Um, and I know most of you are like, well, what about bacon? I like bacon too, um, but, but bologna just doesn't take much effort, right? I can just throw it on there unless I fry it up. Um, 
But one of my biggest gaffes in life, uh, by the way, we're, we're working with uh, every week trying to figure this, this thing out. We'll get it figured out uh, by November 1st when we're not out here anymore. But is this really loud? No, you're good. Okay, good. All right. And it's just my wife who's like, gosh, turn that down. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I got in big trouble. I'm, I wasn't much of a rebellious kid, but I, I, the, the worst trouble I ever got into uh, was over a bologna sandwich. Yeah, so I, I'm at the counter. I'm about seven, eight years old. I'm at the counter. I've got the mayonnaise out. I got the bologna out. I got the bread. I got the cheese, and I'm making my bologna sandwich. And my father comes in the kitchen, and he says, oh, so did your mom tell you that you could have a bologna sandwich after all? And I said, yep, she sure did. She sure did. Well, mom was long gone. She was at the store by then picking up some things for dinner. And uh, there's a few facts of this story. The first fact is this. The first fact is my mother did not say I could have a bologna sandwich. Um, I asked for a bologna sandwich at about 4 o'clock because then when I'm 7, 8 years old, it's impossible to wait an hour for dinner, right? And apparently, the, it's the end of the world to ruin your dinner. Like, when did that become a thing? Like, when did that become a thing? Oh, no, you'll ruin your dinner. Like, how am I ruining dinner by eating something before? Like, if it's really good, mom and dad, wouldn't that just mean there's more for you, right? But so I'm, I couldn't have a bologna sandwich. I begged for the bologna sandwich, and my mom said, no, you cannot have a bologna sandwich because you'll ruin your dinner. And I remember distinctly, I followed her out to the driveway. She got in the van. She started pulling out, and I tried one more time as she was backing out. I said, Mom, please, I'm starving, and I might die if I don't get a bologna sandwich. And she said, you may not have a bologna sandwich, and I'm going to the store now, and I don't want to hear any more. And I decided in that moment she was not going to tell me what to do, and I was going to go inside, and I kid you not, I remember marching inside and yanking open the refrigerator door and pulling out what I need, and I started making my sandwich, and that's when my dad comes in and says, oh, so your mom said you could have a bologna sandwich? And I said, yep, she sure did. And he said, oh, okay. So I went on about my business, never was going to get caught. I made my sandwich. I ate my sandwich, sat down at the dinner table that night. At the dinner table that night, as an eight-year-old, I didn't have the foresight to not say the following. Oh, I am so full. I don't think I can eat any more of this dinner. And Dad said, well, that's probably because you had that bologna sandwich. And my mom was sitting right there. And my jaw just went. And my mom looked at me with a glare that only a mother can give. And many of you know my mother. She's a, she's a, a friendly gal. That was not a friendly look that I got. She looked at me, and my mouth was open. And then she looked at my dad. And my dad did that like, hey, I didn't have anything to do with this. I just, I, you know, that type of thing. I have never been in, in, in more trouble than I got into for that. But see, there was something that happened there that we need to understand. There's, there's a way that we fall into temptation. We fall into sin. There's a way that we get ourselves into these messes that we are in. So, so first of all, there was desire. Right. So I saw that bologna sandwich was good and, and I wanted it. I wanted it, and it got into my mind, it got into my head, and, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's all that I wanted. And then this idea of self-indulgence. If I could eat it, I would be satisfied. If I could just have that sandwich, I would be satisfied, and no, nothing else in the world would matter. That's how focused I was on this. And then my pride gets in the way, right? See, I deserved that bologna sandwich, that, that, that was, that, I should get this bologna sandwich. There's no reason I shouldn't get this bologna sandwich. And I was not about to be told no. Then I started rationalizing. You know, no one's ever going to find out. And not only that, but it doesn't hurt anybody else, right? 
This is just my own little thing. What's the big deal if, if I eat this bologna sandwich? And then all of that turns into more and more and more. See, then the deception comes about, right? So I, I, I do one thing that I shouldn't have done, and now I've got to cover it up. And now I've got to drag somebody else into my mess that I've created. And so, and so now I have to lie about it. And then I have to spend the next hour or so going, okay, how am I going to get away with this? What am I going to do here? And then I start justifying my actions. Oh, come on, it's just a sandwich. Just a sandwich. I mean, who cares? Not the end of the world. I'll just eat it this time, and then next time I'll obey my mom. No big deal. Just a sandwich. And then, then we start, I start passing off the blame, right? This isn't my fault. It's not my fault God gave me this desire for bologna sandwiches, right? That's not my fault. It's not my fault I got caught. It's my dad's fault that I got caught. He's the one that said something. So I'm angry at my dad. I'm, a I'm angry at, at my desire for bologna sandwiches. I'm angry at my mom. I'm angry at all of these things except for myself. Do you see yourself in there? See, the Bible contains the greatest and most important story ever told. It's the story of God. It's the story of us, as we talked about last week. It's the story of God's continual revelation of his character to us. It's a story in which we must consider where we are found. And we talked last week about the power of story and, and what stories usually involve. And a story usually involves a character, a main character. And in this case, the character is us. And that character has a problem. In this story, the, the problem is we, we sin. And in most stories, we meet someone who can help us. In this case, it's God who creates a plan. And the plan is God sends his own son, Jesus. And Jesus calls us to action. He calls us to obedience to God's kingdom and enables us the opportunity to avoid failure. That failure is an unfulfilled life, spiritual death, and it ends in success, this abundant, eternal life. So today we started with the good news. We started with the good news. The good news is that, that God is in control, that God has created a, a plan. God has created a way out. God is in control. Last week we talked about how, how God created. In the beginning, God created. So we know that God exists. We know that God is uncreated. He is separate from all of creation. In other words, he was not created. We know that God does create. He created everything. Everything we see, hear, feel, touch, taste, smell, everything God created. And where we ended last week, we ended with his creations are good. They are good. In each day that God creates in Genesis 1, it ends with God saying, and it was good. He looked at it and said, this is good. In other words, this is the way I intended it. This is what I had in my creative mind. And it came out exactly the way I'd hoped. And it was good. Everything was good. Everything. It was right. Things were the way God intended them to be. Things were whole, lacking nothing. But see, we can look around right now and we can know that that is not the case. There's something that happened. Something shattered that wholeness so that now the world around us and our lives are lacking Something happened. And it's not much fun to talk about what happened. But we have to talk about what happened. This is a part of the story. And if we don't talk about the, the difficult things, it's impossible to celebrate 
the good things that God can do and will do. So we're in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. And we're going to read from verses 1 through 13. And if you're willing and able, would you mind standing with me for the reading of God's word? Starting in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he said to Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree? In the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I guess, right? Like that's that's kind of a hard one to say thanks be to God. It's not very happy, it's not very celebratory, it's not it's not it's not uplifting. It's not, oh, I'm going to leave I'm going to leave church today and and oh, I'm just going to feel good. I'm going to be able to get on with my week and it's going to be a great start and ah, I'm just feeling so good. This is a tough one. But we have to know where things went wrong so that we can truly understand how things get right. Let me say that again. We have to understand how things go wrong, how things went wrong, so that we can understand how things get right. So what I want to do here briefly, and guys, I understand you're sitting in the sun. I see many of you out here doing this. I know it's probably not the most comfortable uh, situation right now. The breeze feels good. I'm up in the shade, okay? Just bear with me for just a little bit. I'm aware of the fact it may not be real comfortable out there. And I'm also aware of the fact of what I'm about to say here for the next few minutes isn't going to be very comfortable either. Bear with me, there's good news. There's good news. Let's understand the evolution of sinful acts. Okay, let's understand how we get to the point where we get out of favor with God. Uh, How do we get to the point where we sin Okay, we get to the point where we sin and everything gets messed up because a lot of times we try to convince ourselves that I don't even know how I got here. Right. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we go, oh, my goodness, what have I done? Right. What have I done? How did I get here? What a what a mess I've created. But guys, I'm convinced that there is a point where we can stop all of it. And go, wait a second. I don't need to go there. I don't need to get into that situation. 
And it's important for us to understand how Satan tempts us. Using this, using the story of Adam and Eve and how the serpent, how Satan tempted them, we can understand how Satan is going to tempt us. Because I'll tell you this, the same way he tempted them in the garden is the same way he tempted Jesus in the desert. The framework is very similar, and this is what Satan does over and over and over again. And, and kids and young people, I know it's kind of scary sometimes to think that perhaps there might be this thing called the devil and this thing called Satan that would like nothing more than to tear your life apart. That's scary, but it's the truth. And if anybody's hiding that truth from you, they are doing you a disservice. There is a devil who would like nothing more than to rip your life apart. He would like nothing more than to convince you that what you're doing is okay. It's fine. You'll figure it out at some point. Or to convince you that everything's going to be okay. It's all going to be good. Well, your friends are doing it. Oh, you probably, maybe you saw your parents doing that at home. But Satan would like to convince you that everything's going to be okay, and that this isn't a big deal. It's a big deal. First of all, we see the precursor to every sinful act is that the devil is present. Plain and simple, plain and simple, the devil is present. Okay? Now, the, the, we can resist the devil, and he will flee, Right? We serve a God who is much more powerful than the devil, okay? But the devil is present, okay? Meaning his desire to entice you and bait you and get you to do things that you shouldn't do is going to be ever present. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, again, we don't have to fear the devil because we serve a God who's bigger than the devil, but we have to be aware that the devil would like to get us to do things we should not do. He would like to have control of our life. So the devil is present. The devil always twists the truth. The devil always twists the truth. If you see scripture, if you read scripture and see the times where, where Satan shows up, he never blatantly comes out and does exactly and says the exact opposite of what God says. He always takes what God says and he twists it just a little bit. Just enough. Just enough to make us go, oh, well, hang on a second. Let me, let me rethink what God may have said right there. So listen to what he says to, uh, to, to Eve, right? In verse 1, it says, Now the serpent, the devil, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he says this to the woman, Did God really say? Listen to the power of that statement. Did God really say, did God really say this? Did, did God really say that? Is that really, do you, is that really what, what the original writers of the Bible meant? I mean, surely, surely, you know, people would understand that, you know, this was written hundreds of years ago and, you know, times have changed. I mean, times have just changed. I mean, culture is different now. And, and, you know, surely God understands how difficult it is to live in our time now. And so the devil takes these little truths of God and he doesn't say, oh, God is full of it. He says, are you sure that's what God meant when he said that? And so he makes you question God's word just a little bit. And then he says to Eve, and I haven't caught this before, but it makes a lot of sense. 
Satan made Eve question God's love for her, God's acceptance of her. He says, do you, Eve, do you think this is what God meant? Do you really think that God has your best interest at heart? Because, you know, if, if you do eat this, you're going to know what he knows. So he must not love you much if he's trying to keep things from you. He must not really care about you much if he's trying to keep this from you and this from you and this from you. So he makes Eve question God's word. He makes Eve question God's love. And then in verse 4, he just, he does. He just completely denies God's word. And he inserts his own truth. Says the fact is, Eve, if you do eat this, then you'll know as much as God. God never said that. That's what Satan says. So the devil is always present. The devil always twists the truth. And then desire in temptation drags us away. The book of James says this in, in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There's always a desire See, Satan has this way of, of putting something in front of us that he wants us to, to desire more than the goodness of God. He wants us to have our focus on that, our attention on that, everything on that, because if we can focus on that, then we're not focused over here on God where we need to be focused. So there's an enticement. There, there's a desire. It says the, the tree was pleasant to the eyes in verse 6. The tree was good for food, it says in verse 6. And then the tree was desirable to make one wise. So just like in the temptation of Jesus, Satan to Eve shows, gives her the lust of the eyes, gives her something good to look at. Then gives her the lust of the flesh, something that, that I want to eat or something that I want to feel, something that I want to taste, something that I want to experience. And then taps into the biggest downfall of all of us. Taps into her pride. Says, you could, you could know just as much as God. You could know just as much as God. Wouldn't that be pretty cool, Eve? You could have all the knowledge that God has. So then at this point, what happens is what happens to all of us when we come to this point. See, Eve has not sinned yet. Eve has listened. She has heard. She has been enticed. The temptation is there, but Eve has not sinned. But she comes to a point where she gets to make a choice. She gets to make a conscious decision. She knows what God has told her, and she gets to make the choice. Am I going to believe God's truth? Am I going to believe God's word? Or I'm, am I going to believe Satan's twisted version of this truth? And we know she gave in. She made that choice. But it's important for us to understand it is a conscious choice. You all know it. We all know it. When we give in to sin, there is a moment. There is a moment where we are able to say, am I going to do this or am I not? I know this isn't right, but man, it sounds really good. There is a moment. Eve had that moment. Jesus had that moment. Jesus resisted it. The devil fleed, fled 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 when we're at that moment we have a choice and so that fatal step is taken the bond of trust is broken and we are lost and we know that we're naked vulnerable we're easily hurt our neighbor that, that's given to us to be our neighbor to be neighborly becomes our rival 
the world that's given to us to be our garden becomes a wilderness with which we have to fight. And folks, this is original sin. This is the fall. This is the curse of humanity that our default, that people everywhere at all times since the fall of Adam and Eve have had this innate depravity of heart, which leads us to sin as soon as we are able to sin. And it's a condition. It's our default. It's original sin. The disobedience of Adam and Eve and God's resulting judgment. See, God says all humanity will be cursed. We believe that this is the bad news. We believe that we are not born good. We are not born innately good. We are born innately with this propensity to go against what God wants, but not just go against what God wants, to go for what we want, right? To go for what we want. It's born into us. It's original sin. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. But see, here's the good news. There's good news. And this is the good news we celebrate. We, we, we talk about the bad news. We understand the bad news so that we can celebrate the good news. The good news is the story isn't over. This isn't the end of the story. This is, this is just the bad news. This is just the problem. This story isn't over. See, the rest of Romans 6.23 says this, The gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the good news is coming. The good news is coming. This is the bad news today. But the good news is coming. There's a part of the story that's yet to be told. Most of us know it, but we're going to tell it in the next few weeks. That God creates a plan that Jesus, he creates a plan, his son Jesus, to come to earth and to call us to something, to get us out of this mess. And he makes it possible that we don't have to live in the wages of our sin. That's the good news. But today... Today we leave here, this place, with the bad news. And I think that's okay. I'd love to walk out of here right now, and I'd love to stand over there like I do about every week. And I'd, I'd, I'd love for several of you who are so encouraging to come up to me afterwards and to go, wow, that was so good. Wow, that was, that was great. Here's the truth. This isn't great. This isn't good. But we have to understand the bad news before we can know how to come to the good news and celebrate the good news. This isn't comfortable. It's not uplifting. It's not energizing. But it's critical to the story of who we are and what God still wants to do in our hearts. So God, we thank you for your truth. God, we thank you for the truth that is found in you. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you do, God, have a plan and that plan is still unfolding. Not just in the next six days before we hear the next sermon next week, but God, this, your plan is unfolding even in our midst. Your kingdom is coming to life. It's here, but it's still unfolding, God. And you are still calling your people to heart transformation.
to set aside what, what Satan wants to say about us or to us, and to trust and believe and have faith in the truth that is found in your words, God. So continue to grow us. Continue to be with us, Father. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a couple things before I send you with a blessing. On your bulletin, if you have one, if you're new with us today or maybe you've been here a few times and we haven't been able to connect with you, like we've said, it's kind of difficult to do that out here. It's easy to kind of just get out of here. We'd love to connect with you. There's a QR code on the bulletin if you have one. If you could scan and you're willing to give us some information, uh, we would love to connect with you uh, sometime this week. Maybe you just have a prayer request that you'd like to share for us that with us. There's a place on there where you can make some comments. So even if we know you, uh, we'd love to connect with you and know how to pray for you uh, in that way. Um, hey, on October 28th, uh, we are having a version of Trunk or Treat out here. It's going to look a little bit different than it's looked like in the past, uh, but we are having Trunk or Treat out here, way uh, here in this open area over here. Uh, we really need some trunks, so um, be... Uh, be aware of opportunities to sign up for that. You'll see those in some emails and in the newsletter this week, but we'd love to uh, uh, provide a trunk or treat in a, in a, in a safe way, and we, we think we can accomplish that. So uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that uh, by decorating uh, some trunks. Finally, finally, uh, over here is our, I can't see it, this container thing is in the way but on a table over there um, is a little box where you can place your offering uh, as you walk by there uh, if you want to do that and you can still give online uh, on tithely you can look up Lawrence First Church and we'll be there and we continue to uh, just be blessed by your faithful giving your generosity all right would you stand with me now And would you receive this blessing this morning as we go? People of God, go now, walking in his truth, living in his truth, not allowing anyone else to twist God's word and try to draw you away from the truth and the love and the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Go now in his will and in his ways. Amen. Amen.